The following message is a presentation of Valley Metro Church, a community of believers dedicated to knowing God and making Him known. The Bible's got a theme of giving God our first fruits. Everyone say first fruits. It's a concept that's a theme throughout the Bible, giving God our first fruits, setting things apart. Sunday was the first day of the week. The church dedicated that to the Lord. used to be Saturday in the Old Testament. The New Testament believers celebrated on Resurrection Sunday, giving God the first fruits. And when you put God first and give him the first fruits in your life, there is blessing that follows that. God simply honors that in every facet of life. Um, It's a new year. And to take some focused time out to get together with God and really search our hearts and seek Him, He will honor that. We did this last year, and what we'll do is we'll meet at Chatsworth Park. It's at the end of Chatsworth Street as far as you can go. There's a park right there. We're going to meet there. It opens at 6.30 in the morning to unlock the gates. It's before sunrise. Sunrise is at 7 this year. We're going to have a short devotional. Everyone go up on a hill and bring your word and bring something to write with and get alone with God. And then we'll come down and have some breakfast burritos. You know what I'm talking about? Because we've got, we got to end that way. Um, some coffee and some OJ. But there's something about getting away with God. And last year when we did this, God showed everybody so many things. And if you don't think God speaks, stay tuned. Because God does speak. The Bible says, never says that he would stop speaking. In fact, the word says that you'll hear the voice behind you saying, this is the way you should go, walk in it. The wonderful counselor will give us counsel and direction and lead us in the way we should go. That's what God does by his spirit. So there's something about taking this time. I want to encourage gentlemen, all of you, if you've never done this before or if you have done it before, come meet us at the park. Uh, You might want to skip a meal or two beforehand just so you're in in a place where you literally hunger. And there's something about not eating in the natural and being hungry for God in the spiritual, there's a dynamic throughout the Bible of how it heightens things in the spiritual realm. So if, you, if you're up for that discipline, I encourage you to come out, but God will honor that, God will bless that, and there will be revelation, and uh, you won't regret it. You won't regret it. Um, I want to start out by saying Happy New Year, but there's a kind of misnomer about Happy New Year. We all say Happy New Year, that's the tradition, happy um, the Bible doesn't talk so much about happiness. God's a little more, more concerned about our holiness than our happiness. The Bible talks about joy a lot, not so much happiness. Uh, happiness is a, is a big difference between joy and happiness. Uh, happiness is based on happenings, the things happening around you and I. And you and I, we cannot control the things happening around us. And so hoping that we're happy is a little hard to... To really aim at because we can't really control all the happening things around us. So we, we kind of set ourselves up for failure. But joy, on the other hand, joy is something that comes from the Lord. It's a fruit of the Spirit. The Bible has a lot to say about that. And God wants you to have joy. God wants you to have a deep joy in your heart regardless of what's happening around us. So happiness may not be happening all the time. But joy is something God's aiming at. And I want to look this... Uh, This message this morning, I want to look at you and I having joy and purpose in this new year, more than just being happy. And when we look at the Apostle Paul, he had a couple things down really well when it comes to purpose and joy, no matter what he went through. In fact, we're going to be looking at a passage in the book of Philippians. You might want to turn there, Philippians chapter 3. But Philippians was probably the most difficult time in, in Paul's life ever. I mean, it was, it was horrendous. The guy's going through it. Uh, it seems like he's going to die soon. He's in prison, and yet he's got profound joy, and he's got profound purpose. And this ought to speak volumes to us because he had this, he had this winning attitude. He had this attitude about overcoming. You see, this is the time of the year, if there's any time of the year, that we focus on our aim, on our goals, on vision, on purpose. If there's ever a time to do it, it's right now. We're kind of like we're getting into a new year and we start kind of readjusting. We start focusing on, on, on what our agenda, our aim, our goals, our direction. Paul's going to share some things today that I'm hoping we glean from because he's got this winning attitude that is an overcoming attitude. Paul lived victoriously even though he, his world could have been caving in. He could have been in jail ready to die and the happenings 
did not rock his world. So Paul wasn't saying, I'm so happy here in jail because everything happening is so great. He's like, no, things are not happening really well, but he's got joy, he's got purpose, he's living in victory, and even when he's in this place, he's giving life. The Spirit of God moving through him, writing this letter, he's giving life that's living on for 2,000 years. Something radical is going on about how we can be victorious and overcoming. And my prayer is that Paul's approach would become our approach. Because I think when you see the way he presents this right here, it is so powerful, so powerful, so much revelation. So if you have your Bibles, uh, Philippians chapter 3, we're looking at a few verses today. I want to take them in sections because there's a lot of revelation in this. Um, I do believe that if we take these words to heart, this is the best way to end a year and to launch into a new one. I honestly don't think there's a better chunk of the scripture than, than this right here to get, a, to get the right heart condition and the right mindset on what God has for us and how to wrap up our past year. Uh, Philippians chapter 3 says, Paul was talking about uh, what he's aiming at and what he's attained and what he hasn't attained. And he says in verse 12, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but... I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Uh, let's camp out right here for a second because it's, it's pretty amazing. When we think of Paul's attitude, when we think how he lives victoriously, when we think how he's such an overcomer, we, we got to look at these words right here. He starts out with a pretty straightforward statement, but an important one. He's like, look, I know God's using me and I know where I'm from. But I want to be clear, I have not attained what I'm going to attain. I have not arrived. And this is so important because somebody who's an apostle like Paul, who is being used by God to write scriptures and even raise the dead, okay? This is pretty radical stuff. He's like, no, I I haven't arrived. And you're thinking, seriously? (laughs) That sounds like about as far as you can go. And he's like, no, no, uh, I'm a work in progress. I haven't arrived. And I just love that humility of somebody as radical as Paul who starts out saying, look, I don't have it all down. I haven't arrived and I'm still very teachable. And that blows me away. In fact, when you look at the writings of Paul, you find out that he's more teachable in his, the end of his life than he was early on. When he just got converted, when he just came to faith, he was really zealous, really strong. He's like really dogmatic. And later on, his heart started to soften up. In the beginning, if you follow along in the book of Acts, he, he's arguing with Barnabas a little bit, very zealous, and telling John Mark, who's a young believer, who quit on one of the mission trips, you're never coming with us again because you're a quitter, he told him. That's it, period. No room for quitters in God's kingdom. And later on at the end of his life, is like, you know what? Would you bring John ba- Mark back? He's valuable, and I love him, and I miss him. And uh, he changes his whole... He, see, Paul becomes more and more teachable. And there's something radical about that. We got to say that because there's something about God's kingdom and getting in on everything God has for you by remaining teachable. And I say that because sometimes folks are like, yeah, I did, I'm not learning anything about that. Yeah, I already know that. And kind of go through very discounting a lot of things where, you know, honestly, church, we could go over right now to the children's ministry and we could hear a lesson that's being taught by one of our wonderful children's ministry Uh, workers over there today, children's ministry leaders, we can hear a message about the kingdom of God that's being presented to a first grade group of kids, and we all ought to be able to learn from that. Do you you agree with that? If we're not teachable on that level, we're going to miss out on stuff. I watch my kids. I learn stuff all the time. Uh, We got to remain teachable that way. Well, Paul's attitude is like that. And if you're a note taker this morning and you want to know how to take hold of what God has and to press on and to be victorious in these ways, uh, the first point this morning is to remain very teachable. I mean, be, be intentional about it. Remain very teachable. Be open. God, whatever you want to show me, I'll admit, like Paul, I don't have it down. I'll admit I have not arrived. I'm not going to pretend I have. And so that's a, that's a big part of having the right uh, heart condition. And Paul talks about arriving at his goal. Again, this is the time of the year that people are thinking of their goals, their aim, their agenda, what their you know, uh, resolutions and you know, what the future is like and vision. And we're going to talk more about vision uh, next week. 
Uh, but Paul has this goal, and I'm glad he has a goal. We should have a goal too. I don't know if you guys have goals or what they are. This should be the time of the year you're really getting together with God on this topic of your, your goal. And I got to say, regarding goals, some goals don't matter very much. They really don't. Uh, when you're thinking about your goals, ask yourself the question, what's going to matter in 50 years? What's going to matter in 50 years? And the goals that you're holding on to right now, are they ones that are going to matter in 50 years or not? Because some goals are just little goals, and some goals are big goals. Some are temporary goals, temporal, and some are eternal, profound, and spiritual, and impactful. I mean, when you're thinking of your goals, really think about goals on this kind of level. It's really important to do that. Paul has goals that matter. And my prayer is we'll have goals that seriously matter. I mean goals that are big, God-sized goals, not little puny goals, big goals. Ours should matter as well. And I'm going to suggest that Paul's goal right here, the goal that he has, should be ours. And we're going to read about Paul's goal because he's got this winning attitude. This guy's victorious. He's an overcomer. He's more than a conqueror. The guy's in jail right now, and it's one of the most inspiring things that he, God used him to write. I'm thinking, how do you do this? He's like, well... Here's, here's, here's my goals. Here's my attitude. This is what he says. It's the second point this morning, if, you, if you're a note taker. It says in verse 12, this, here's his attitude, to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. This is huge. If you get one thing today, please get this. Take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. You can't take hold of something unless you know what you're taking hold of. You can't take hold of air. You can't take hold of invisible things. You've got to know what you're taking hold of. And Paul's like, yeah, I know what I'm taking hold of. He goes, I got a goal. I got an aim. I know what I am taking hold of. I say that because people are taking hold of all sorts of random things that aren't going to matter. Paul's like, I know what I'm taking hold of. He go, he's like, I know God has me for, here for a reason. I know God woke me up. I know God called me out. I know God put his spirit in me. I know God's got a hope and future for me. I know what I know that God called me out for a reason and that is what I'm taking hold of. Does that make sense? It's not like he wakes up and goes, hey, I have a good plan. I think I want to aim this way this year. Here's a good plan. I'm going to take hold of that. It's much bigger than that. He starts his goal with God called me specifically for a reason. Every one of you in this room, you were made for such a time as this. God knew you before you were born. He had plans for you. There's destiny for you. He's got works for you to do. The scripture is full of this. We hit on this all the time. There is clarity in God's kingdom for you. Not random happenstance, not whatever, wherever the wind blows. There's definition for your life. There's a living God with purpose. He's a God of order who wants to lead all of us with some clarity and definition. And Paul's like, I know that. And that's what I'm taking hold of. He's like, that's the reason God took hold of me in the first place. God called me out and he woke me, woke me up and I'm, I haven't arrived yet. I don't have it down, but I'm not who I used to be and I'm not who I'm yet gonna be. But God woke me up. He put his spirit in me. He made his word come alive to me. He's using me for his glory. I am taking hold of that. Now, this is profound because some people appreciate that God woke them up, appreciate the word of God, appreciate having the spirit, but don't take hold of that. This is huge, guys. Take hold of it. Paul's talking about taking hold. He's like, I know the reason. And the reason that God woke you up and called you out, and the reason that you're here today, whether you've come to terms with it or not, is the two main reasons that we got to take hold of is the first part is relationship with God. As Christy shared earlier today, the first thing that God did in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned is make provision for them. Why? Because he was trying to restore relationship that the sin shattered. It broke everything. God's like, look, you guys are hiding. <laughs> we used to walk together. We used to be in intimate relationship. God used to walk around in the garden with Adam and Eve and and their sin separated that. They're all hiding behind a bush trying not, because that's what sin does. It makes us run. It makes us hide. It makes us go under the radar. It makes us go off the grid. Did you know that? That's what sin does. It makes us go off the grid. We don't want to be in his house. We don't want to be in his presence because that's what sin does. It makes us kind of run. And God's like, I love you. I'm pursuing you. I'm still walking through the garden looking for you. I'm finding you behind the bush. I'm calling you out and I'm making provision for you because God 
is a relational, loving God. And that's the first reason why God uh, took hold of us, is for intimacy, literally. Relational intimacy with the living God. And you've got to say that because relationship comes way before anything that you and I will ever do for God. Sometimes we put like, well, what can I do for you, God? In response, that's beautiful, but it's always secondary to relationship. Does that make sense? I mean, if our relationship isn't priority with God, our intimacy with God is not the priority, we're totally missing everything. But number one is our intimacy with God. And the other part really is our service. You know, God created us in Christ Jesus to do good works that he established from the foundations of the world. There's good works works that God has ordained for us. And you and I are on this journey after the intimacy to say, wow, God, what are these things? I want to get in on them. I want to live with that kind of purpose. Paul's saying, I'm taking hold of that. I don't know about what you're taking hold of this morning, but I want to ask you that question. What are you taking hold of this year? We're about to launch a new year. You're going to take hold of something. What are you aiming at? What are you going for? What, what, what's, your, what's your passion, your zeal? What are you, what are you, where are you directed to? What are you taking hold of? Like, I'm, I'm going for this thing. Because Paul says, you know what I'm taking hold of? The reason he took hold of me, that's what I'm taking hold of. And I don't know if you realize how powerful that is. It's like, it's like God reaching down with a purpose and you reaching back and saying, bam, grabbing the hand of God saying, I got it. You're reaching to me and I'm reaching back to you and I'm taking hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I love the visual on that. Um, Some people right now have goals to take hold of that probably the most common one statistically is, I'm going to lose a couple pounds. Right, New Year's? Who's going to get in better shape? Let's be honest. Okay, yeah, we're all going to, you know, go to the gym a little once instead of never or twice instead of one. Right, that's, that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. We're body, soul, and spirit. God made us in a body, soul, and spirit. The body's the temple of the spirit. That's good. Eat well. Get rid of your hydrogenated oils and red dye number 40, whatever. You know, all that stuff is uh, corn syrup. You know, that's good. They lose that stuff and, 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 and stay in shape and eat well. That's beautiful. Some are, well, I think I'm going to start picking up the piano again or a little violin. That's great. I'm going to read more books. I'm going to spend some more time reading But It's beautiful. But that's little stuff. Because that's not the stuff that will matter in 50 years. That's not bad. It's not bad. But if our aim is to aim that low with losing a couple pounds or eating a little better, as nice as those things are, or maybe picking up the violin, as nice as those things are, that's aiming really low when we're called really high. We are called to be sons and daughters of the Most High Living God. We're called with a hope and a future. We're called to be ambassadors. We're called to great things. We're called to be victorious overcomers. We are called to represent. We are called to function in our gifts for His glory and the power of the Spirit. And yet, yet, sometimes we're aiming at, well, I'm just going to lose a couple pounds and pick up the violin. That's aiming kind of low, isn't it? In that, in that perspective, I want to encourage you guys, aim high. Aim really high. Um, God called us for higher things than that. He called us. Those are good, but let those be supplemental. Let those be like the little things. Let those be down lower on your list. And by the way, I'm going to exercise a little more and lose a couple, whatever that is. That's great. But aim high. This is the time of the year where God is calling us out and he's calling us up. He's calling us. We are living in unprecedented days, church. Do you realize that? We are living in unprecedented times. We are seeing things right here, right now, as that song, watching the world wake up in front of me. Remember that? Right here, right now. Guys, is that old school for you guys? Uh, Watching the world wake up from history. Literally, we are watching stuff that has never happened in the history of humanity. The last hundred years, people were getting by in horse and buggy and sailboats for thousands and thousands of years, and yet we go from steam engines to nuclear physics to sending things to Mars to radiation and atomic bombs, and it's changing faster and faster through information highway, and we're looking at a process that's in place right now that is going so fast, and God said, God said, that's when I want you to be born. You're not here by a freak in nature. You're not here by happenstance. By God's sovereign design, he's like, I'm putting you here right now. In, by the way, the most well-endowed country on the planet. Whether we stay that way or not, that's up to God. But I'll tell you, God's got you in the most privileged place, no matter where you think your place is. 
if you compare yourself to the other six billion people in the world, God's got you in a very privileged position to be in his house, in his presence, to be in a time such as this. It's huge. And that's why we can't go, I'm just going to lose a couple pounds or pick up the violin. It's got to be bigger than that, church. It's got to be bigger. It's got to be like Paul going, you know what? I am taking hold of that for which he took hold of me. If I don't know what it is, I'm going to figure out what it is. I'm going to discover what it is, and I'm going to take hold of it. I'm not just going to look at it. I'm not going to wonder about it. I'm going to take hold of that. I don't know if you guys up for that, church? Because this is where it begins, man. This is the kingdom getting traction in the world you live in, in the timing, in the strategy, in the place, in the geography that God placed you, in the circles of influence around you. God is brilliant in this stuff. I think we miss out on it. I know I do. We miss out on opportunities. We don't see things for what they could be because we're focused on the wrong things. But when we're doing like Paul, here's one thing I do know. I'm taking hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I love this stuff. It's really great. He is like, God has a plan. I am part of it. I've discovered why God took hold of me. And now I'm taking hold of that reality. This is where it begins. This is taking the kingdom seriously. This is finding your place in God's kingdom. He gave gifts and diversities all for a reason. Finding out what they are, discovering your spot in God's beautiful orchestration is where it begins. And I love what Paul says. And by the way, if you haven't discovered your gifts, find out, pray and seek God. Gentlemen, come up on the hill. Come up on the hill and you ask God. What specifically do you have before me? What am I supposed to take hold of, God? Show me. Watch what he shows you. I love Paul. He's like, now that I've told you, he's saying that I take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. He's like, here's how I actually do it. I mean, it's a great principle. God, you took hold of me. I'm taking hold of that. For the reason you took hold of me, I'm grabbing back on. So it's a mutual grab. God reaching down, me reaching up. Bam, we're locked with God on this principle. He's like, here is how I do it. He goes on in verse 13. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He starts out again saying, look, I don't claim to have arrived yet. He said that twice now. Uh, I'm still a work in progress and I don't have it all figured out. Yes, God's using me and the dead are being raised and some other stuff's going on. It's really great, but I haven't attained it yet. I'm not there yet. And I love this humility because I think it's a prerequisite to get in on God's kingdom. It's a prerequisite to be open and teachable and humble that way. And here he is in this profound place, still as humble as can be. He goes, but here is the one thing I do. Now, from the Apostle Paul, who many consider to be some super apostle, he's like, here's one thing I do. He's telling you and I, if there's one thing you do, do this. And he sets it up that way. And here's what he says, the third point this morning, if you're a note taker. Here's the one thing I do. One thing is this, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. This is a key, you guys. This is a key to God's kingdom if you want to live in victory. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. Paul's been through so much stuff. He's been knocked around and beat up, people mistreated. He's been through so much stuff. If a guy like Paul holds on to the stuff that he's been through, he's going to be stuck and parked forever. But he's not. He's a guy that no matter what he goes through, he can still press on in some radical way. And you look at his life and go, How did you go through what you went through and still come out on the other side, not smelling like smoke, like Shadrach, Meshach? How how did you go through all that with such victory and such a victorious attitude and an overcomer and more than a conqueror? How do you do that, Paul? He's like, I'm telling you, here's the one thing I do. If there's one thing, hold on to this. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. This is a profound reality, especially at this time of the year for you and I to take to heart in a big way. The key is forgetting and straining. Would you say that with me? Forgetting and straining. One more time. Forgetting and straining. Here's a key, guys. Forgetting 
and straining. There's some things we've got to strain towards, and there's some things we've got to forget. And here we are at this beautiful time of the year to really come to terms with this and reconcile some things. There's some things we've got to leave behind, and there's some things we've got to push toward. What are the things you've got to leave behind? Um, the things you've got to leave behind, you've got to start with the wrongs that we have done and the wrongs done to us. Whatever wrongs you have done, get together with God, confess those things. Whatever wrongs have been done to you, you've got to leave them behind. Um, here's the thing. If you don't, and this happens to anybody, we're all capable of this. In fact, it happens real easy, is to hold on to things that we were wronged in some kind of way. Somebody mistreated, misspoke, whatever the case is, and we hold on to. And Paul is like, here's the key, guys. You can never strain towards the prize God has for you. You won't make it. It's not attainable if you're holding on to stuff from back there. And it's our very nature to hold on to stuff back there. I can't believe this, or how come they this, and I deserved that, but I got this. And, you know, yes, yes. But after we're done with the little violin, you know, and the pity party, um, we got to move on. Because Paul's a guy that got treated like he never should have got treated. He could have said, hey, I'm a servant of God. Why are you guys treating me like this? I deserve better than that. I have a calling in my life. I've got an, an annoy. I've got, no, he didn't say any of those things. He's like, look, I know God's shown me a lot. I'll admit I don't have it all down. God's using me for profound ways, but I'm not who I'm going to be. I haven't arrived yet. I haven't attained. I'm still teachable. But one thing I do, one thing I do, you want to know my secret to victory? You want to know my key to success in the kingdom of God? The apostle Paul says, here it is. I'm going to drop the bomb. Forget what's behind and strain towards what's ahead. It's enormous. I know we say that, but do we do it? Now, to do things like this, this is going to be a shift, honestly, in the way, some of the way we think. We don't naturally leave everything behind. That's not the human nature to do that. In fact, the human nature is to, is to kind of make sure that uh, people get what they deserve. That's our nature. Our nature is we didn't deserve that and I can't believe people or I, I'm still offended by that and I'm holding on to that offense and I'm holding on to that hurt. There's going to have to be an intentional shift in our attitude, a very intentional shift as we transition out of one year into the next if we're going to live for the glory of God in a profound way in this next year. Uh, it, it, it's a discipline really and that's what disciples of Christ are. They're people who walk in disciplines we're saved by grace, and that's beautiful. But yet, when you come into God's kingdom through what Jesus did, we become a disciple, which means you and I learn how to work some things out. It's like you get a free membership to God's gym, but you've got to start exercising and doing something. It's kind of like that. Disciplines are what a disciple's about. And disciplines are like, all right, God, I'm all ears. Show me what steps I need to take. What sort of exercise, what kind of shift do I need to have? What kind of adjustments do I need to make? What kind of workout do you have for me spiritually? And I would tell you this mindset of Paul, his attitude, his heart condition is a discipline. I am choosing to forget what's behind and strain towards what ahead, what's ahead. Um, you got to forget certain things. I would say at the same time, there are certain things you got to recall. Can I suggest what you got to recall? Forgetting the wrongs that you have done, the wrongs done to you, the things, your failures, mistakes, shortcomings, these things, get together with God, do business, and leave them behind and move forward in victory. The things we got to recall, and we see this come up again through the word, is when God has shown you something, when God has revealed something to you, when he has answered a prayer, you've been praying for someone and God moved into life, these sort of things, you better recall those, that's part of your testimony. And testimony needs to be in recall mode. Uh, so many times with Israel, so many times, they're going through the desert and they said, didn't God deliver us from Egypt? And didn't God feed us with manna from heaven? And didn't God lead us by a cloud by day and fire by night? And didn't God bring water from the rock? And didn't God part the seas? And didn't God do all these things? And there's something about recall that we see throughout Scripture. We see it in the Psalms, in the book of Acts. We see him recalling what God's done. There's something about recalling and remembering some of the radical things God's done. That's important. But there's some stuff we got to forget. And if we don't forget it, we'll never be able to run the race that God's calling us to. Um, I don't know if you guys uh, realize uh, the method that they use 
to catch monkeys. Uh, monkeys are crazy. They run all over the place. You can't run behind them and catch them and throw a net on monkeys. They, you just never would catch them. But the way they catch monkeys is pretty unique, and I think it speaks volumes to our lives as well. They take a really big, heavy box, and they drill a hole in it, and they take a coconut, drill a hole in it so you can smell that coconut, and they just drop it in that little hole in that box. And a monkey comes along, and he sniffs out that coconut. He looks in there, smells like a coconut, sticks his arm in, feels like a coconut. He wants it really bad, and he tries pulling his hand out, and he can't get his hand out. And when the captors come up, he won't let go of that coconut to run free because he wants that coconut so bad. And they just come and they just throw a net on the monkey. And that's how they capture monkeys. It's kind of humorous, but honestly, it's not so much different, I don't think, than what the devil uses for you and I. Although it's not a coconut in a box, the devil uses other things that you and I won't let go of. Instead of forgetting what is behind and taking hold of, I still think that we still somehow, like that monkey, got our hand in a box holding on to something, and God's like, you can't press on toward what's ahead as long as you're holding on to what's behind. I think we do the same thing, guys. And Paul's like, I would never be able to be used by God in any kind of way if I didn't get this one thing down. And he's like, it's the one thing I do. It's the one thing I do. If there's one thing I do, it's this. Forgetting what is behind and straining on to what's ahead. And if that's not a profound you know, revelation, I mean, it speaks volumes to me. So the wrongs we've done, the wrongs done to us, the mistakes, the shortcomings, the, the failures, get together with God, do business, and leave them. Leave them. You can't drag those with you because... The Bible relates our walk with Jesus as a race. We're running this race, and we are never going to win a race holding on to stuff back there. Paul knows that. There's no victory in it. There's no overcoming in it. We'll never be more than a conqueror. We have to forget what's behind and press on towards what is ahead. And he says, actually, straining towards what is ahead. So this isn't some lackadaisical passive. It's not like, well, I'm going to forget what's behind, but... You know, who knows what's ahead? I'll just wait to see what comes. That's not what Paul's doing. In fact, Paul has got this attitude where God's got a prize for me. It's a heavenward call in Christ Jesus, but it's an entire journey. It's not just, Paul's not just talking about heaven when I get there. Paul's talking about the whole journey, the whole race, the whole uh, process is, is a process by which the Spirit of God is leading and empowering me and changing me and changing people around me on the whole way. And on this process, he's like, this is the prize, and I am not only aiming at it, I'm straining at it, I'm leaning into it. Some people stand and look at it neutrally, and I think some actually drag their heels a little bit on the calling and the prize that God has for them. Paul's like, no, I'm forgetting what's behind, and I'm leaning into this thing. I remember when uh, we were kids in New York City, we used to take the ferry, the Staten Island Ferry, over to Manhattan, we called it, instead of Manhattan. But uh, some days were so windy on the front of the ferry, I remember we could lean forward, like almost falling down, leaning forward, straining forward, because the wind would push you and still hold you up. Sometimes the wind would stop and, and you might fall, but you'd be able to lean really far. And I get that picture of Paul. It's like, I'm not just observing the kingdom, I'm not like scoping it out and just kind of wondering. I'm not even thinking about taking my steps. I'm leaning into it. I'm straining. You hear what he's saying about the calling of God and the will of God and what God can do? He's like, I'm leaning into it. I'm like pressing forward. I'm, I'm straining ahead with this thing. God's got a prize. And I want to get in on everything that God has. And I'm leaning and I'm straining into it. And I, I love that picture as well. We're running this race. Um, and, and to strain forward, we've got to look forward. In fact, Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, he says, uh, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom. In other words, forgetting what's behind and straining towards what's ahead. If you and I have our hand at the plow, so to speak, in relationship with our loving God and serving our king, and yet we're looking back and our heart's back there about people or things that went wrong with us or you know, shouldn't have, if we're that, we're not even going the right way. In fact, we'll never even plow a straight line. We'll be plowing in circles when we're 
when we're looking backwards. Jesus said, no, if you got your hand to the plow, look ahead. Paul's like, I'm forgetting what's behind. I'm straining, straining towards what is ahead. Um, Our spiritual growth, according to Paul here, it can't be at stalemate level. Now, think about this as you're transitioning from one year into the next. Because again, some resolutions, some aim doesn't matter. It's not going to matter in 50 years. There's other things that are going to matter big time in 50 years. Because what God does in you and through you will affect others and change people. Um, What's going to matter in 50 years? If your spiritual growth right now is at a stalemate, Make the commitment to God to change that today. Stalemate. You know, like plateau? There are no plateaus in the kingdom of God. Even a guy like Paul who's raising it, he's like, I haven't arrived. You're like, seriously? Come on, Paul. If anyone's got it, if anyone I read about in the New Testament besides, of course, Jesus, you seem to have it. He's like, no, no, I, uh, not me, man. I'm still working it out. I'm, I haven't arrived. I'm still teachable. I'm still... You know, God's showing me stuff in the kingdom. I'm still working on forgetting what's behind and straining towards what's ahead. That's the one thing I do. And I'm looking at this reality of pressing on towards what's ahead. And I'm just, I want to, I want to encourage you, church. Take this time so seriously as you transition from one year to the next. Because this is the time that you really get your aim. This is the time that you put on whatever lens God has for you. This is the time like binoculars where you focus, you get a little laser perspective. This is the time where you start aiming higher and and, and if there's a plateau in your life, in your faith and in your walk, say, you know what? Plateau is over. I'm straining. I'm forgetting what's behind. I'm going to do like Paul. I'm going to do the one thing he does. I'm forgetting what's behind. I'm straining towards what's ahead. I'm aiming at the prize toward the upward call in Christ Jesus. God's got a call. He's got a race marked out for us. I'm going to run it. I'm not going to look at it. I'm not going to wonder what it would have been like to run it. I'm not going to wonder what it would have been like to believe in the word and what God says. I'm not going to wonder what it would be like to be filled with the spirit and having God affect people around me. I'm not going to wonder what it would have been like if I walked in faith. I'm not going to wonder those things. I'm going to strain ahead towards them. You see his attitude? This guy gets in on everything. I think God's looking for people who believe that same thing. I think God's looking for people who say, I don't have it all down either, but I want to forget what's behind, and I want to strain towards what's ahead. I think God's looking for those kind of people. So as we wrap up, in fact, this might be a good time for the worship team to come up. I just want to close on a a couple of things. Faith, faith by definition, looks ahead. Faith, by definition, doesn't look back. Faith's not looking in the rearview mirror. Faith is looking forward, and we're called to live by faith. The just will live by faith. We're saved by grace through faith. The whole journey is, starts by faith, and it's through faith the whole way. Faith looks ahead. If you're still looking back at anything from this last year, and this last year, you know, we have living in some interesting times. And uh, I know many stories from many people I've shared. This, this has just been a tough season for many. I just want to tell you, don't live back there. Yesterday died last night. The past is called the past because it's already past. That's why it's called the past. Don't look back. Press on. Forget what's behind. The Bible says love keeps no records of wrongs. So don't be looking back. Love has no records of wrongs and it, and it hopes all things. Love hopes all things. It says love by definition looks forward and hopes all things. And hope Faith, hope, and love, the Bible tells us about these being the greatest, uh, but hope, hope actually breathes through expectation. And do you b- believe like the song, if God is for us, who can be against us? I mean, do you believe that? Do you, do you walk with that expectation? Or do you walk with a different one? Because guys, the devil would like you to walk with a different expectation. But I think God is saying, will you walk believing in me, in my word, in what I say, Because I think when we start taking him at his word, I think we start experiencing the radical things that he has for his people. These are the winning attitudes. And he just wraps up with this last statement in verse 15. He says, all of us then, all of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if at some point you think differently, well, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. 
He's saying, if you're mature in the faith or consider yourself mature, this ought to be your view. In other words, it's not really open for discussion in God's kingdom. This is the way it's got to be. Forget what's behind. Strain towards what's ahead. Let this be your attitude. And if it's not, God will show you. Have any ever been schooled by God? Has God ever had to school you on something because you weren't getting it, right? School of hard knocks, you know, because we don't get it. And finally, God's got to tune us up and give us a pop quiz. Pop, and you've been quizzed right? It's happened to me. He's like, if you don't get it, God's going to make this clear to you. But I want to get it this way without the pop quiz. And then he says, lastly, he's like, at least live up to what you've already attained. In other words, your position as a child of God, as a son of daughter of God, you already have a position in the heavenlies. God already calls you son. He calls you beloved. You have an inheritance that won't perish, fade, or spoil. It won't go away. You're called a holy priesthood, the priesthood of all believers. He's got a spirit. There's things that we've already attained that can't go away. And he's saying, will you hold on to your position? Will you at least, will we at least live up to what we've already attained? And I think Paul sees believers not only not aiming ahead, but not living to what they've already attained. God's like, This is your position. Do you see yourself the way I see you? And some don't, and some are not living to what we've already attained. I want to pray for you. I'm going to be praying for everyone in here, and myself included, that as we transition this year, and our prayer team is going to come up and pray for for folks, if you have any prayer need at all, healing, health, uh, just finances, uh, any of these areas, God's going to meet us in prayer. But if we're not understanding what we've already attained, We can't live up to it. Understand who you are in Christ. Understand your position. Understand how God sees you. Understand that you're a son, a blood-bought son or daughter of the Most High God. Understand that you're called beloved, that you are a priest, uh, that you are a priest, a prophet, and a king, the the descriptions in in the Bible. I mean, there's some radical dimensions of who we are as his beloved. And this is important because when we understand that, he's like, at least live up to what we've already attained. So I want to just close in prayer on that point of identity and ask God to seal some, some things in our heart. Mighty God, we love you and we thank you for your word. I pray that Paul's attitude would be our attitude. Uh, I pray that we too, Lord, would, would say, here's the one thing I do. I don't know everything and I don't have it all down. And uh, here's one thing that we do, though. We forget what's behind and we strain towards what is ahead. We know that there's a prize in the upward call. It's a heavenly, heavenly call in Christ Jesus, Lord. And I just pray that all of us would begin to aim in a whole new way, God. I pray that all of us in a whole new way would begin to throw off the things that hinder, the things that tangle, that we'd stop looking back. We would throw some things off and we'd start aiming higher. And Lord, I thank you for all the resolutions and the things you're stirring in our hearts, God, uh, body, soul, and spirit. But I pray we would aim higher, God. I pray we, our faith would not plateau. I pray that there would not be a stalemate in your kingdom, that we wouldn't be at a standstill. I pray like Paul that we would press ahead and strain towards what you have for us, God. I believe, Lord, you've made us for such a time as this. And I believe, God, you want to do some profound and radical things through your people in this city at this time. So, Lord, would you make that known to us? Would you use us in radical ways? And, Lord, let your glory be manifest in our city through your people. We love you, God. Do surgery in our hearts. Show us radical things as we launch into a new year. And we thank you in advance for this, Father. And in Jesus' holy name. This has been a presentation of Valley Metro Church. To hear more messages or to support future podcasts, please visit valleymetrochurch.com.